Go to Psalms uh, 100 with me. Psalms 100. It's one of my favorite psalms. <clears throat> Uh, a few years ago, Liddy and I moved from Fort Gratiot, literally right around the corner from uh, this church. Uh, we lived over in uh, Old Farms suburb over there, and uh, we moved from that home to a, a beautiful uh, orchard that came up for sale after the uh, previous owner had passed away. And uh, we were so excited to to buy this house, and we bought this house in, in Lexington, and in the barn, there's there was this old apple fridge. Um, so, it, uh, what? Peach fridge. I call it apple fridge. Fridge. Potato, potato. Uh, so, <laughs> they, in the in our barn, we had these these uh, this fr- big giant fridge. If some of you like in the in the original days of the clearing when we first started, we had like bonfires and stuff over at our house. So some of you have probably even seen it. Um, we, these, these huge, massive doors that Fred, who had the previous owner, he had taken from the sugar factory in Croswell and put on this wall. They're just massive, like at least 300 pounds, like so expensive, so, so heavy. And like, they're like this thick, they're huge, ginormous. Um, and one of the first things we did when we got there, we we're like, okay, these doors, one, too heavy to move. We're not moving them. We're not removing them because that would be too hard. We're not going to do anything with that. It was, it, but it was like, how do we, what do we do to just keep these here? Um, because they're just massive, such cool, cool doors. And um, in, at one point in time, we actually had to take them off the hinges to, to move them, to put up some like new framing around them. And we had like four men who had to try and pick up these doors and like move them away from the wall without killing themselves. And it, the, there's this crazy thing that like you look at a door and these massive, super, super heavy doors can be held by up by something that's this big. Just a massive door on a hinge that's smaller than the palm of my hand and just because of that hinge, this huge door can open and close with the effort of a toddler with two fingers going open and shut. And I, I, I heard this quote once from, uh, from Michael Miller. He said, uh, Thanksgiving is the little hinge on a big door. Thanksgiving is the little hinge on a massive, massive door. And... Here's the reality is doors without hinges are just walls. Like if you remove the hinges from a door, that is no longer a door, that is a wall. They provide no access and they do not open up to the deeper things that are within them. So why am I talking about this? Uh, If you go to Psalms 100, 4 through 5, it says this. It says, enter his gates with what? With thanksgiving. In his courts with praise, give thanks to him, bless his name. Come on. Uh, it, I love uh, it, in verse 5, it says, For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. He has endurance. And in this verse, it, there's, a, there's a picture being formed by the psalmist. The psalmist is literally drawing up a picture as he's writing this going, what do we do when we approach the Lord? First off, he says, there's a gate. Okay. There's a gate. How do you get into that gate? How do you go through that gate? Enter it with what? Thanksgiving. If your house is like my house, you have a front door. Anybody have a house without a front door? (laughs) If you do, tithe of tithe, we will help you. <laughs> like, we will get you a door. <laughs> um, but if you don't have a door, right, then it, there is no gate. And, and really what the psalmist is saying is the front door, the gates of God's home, they open with something. There's a key that unlocks them. And, and there's this, this posture that we have to approach the Lord with, and it is the posture of what? Thanksgiving of thankfulness, of gratitude. And you might be here and you might be thinking, wow, this is a really good Thanksgiving Christ- Thanksgiving message that's two months early. Uh, but 
right now, I, I think that it's really important that we understand what does it mean to be a thankful people? What does it mean to be a thankful cr- Christian? Because a, a door that does not move becomes, what is it? What happens? It becomes rusted. If you have a door that is not moved, is not open, is not changed, and just sits still for a certain amount of time, those hinges get rusty. Um, and what I'd like to suggest to you, when I, I previously I said the key to the front door is Thanksgiving, I would actually say the key to heaven's door is Jesus. But he says what? He says in Matthew, I give you the keys to heaven. Right? So how do you get in if the, if the door is unlocked? The, the, the rotation of the lever is thank you as you open up. Is this making sense? Yeah. This is what I, I wrote this, this thought down. The Christian life without thankfulness is like a door with rusty hinges. It is stiff, it is unmoving, and unable to open to even the most meaningful things in life. Did you hear me? The Christian life without thanksgiving is unmoving. It is stiff. It is not flexible. And it cannot open up to the most meaningful things in life. The thankless person is a person that has become walled off to even God himself. It is not open to anything than what it is already has become, a wall. Do you hear me? If you're a person like that, I'm going to get into it right now. I'm going to step on some toes. If you're a person that when somebody is speaking, you are thinking uh, with this thought process of what is wrong with somebody speaking. I used to do this, especially when I was in ministry school. I would listen to people speak and I would listen for what I disagree with. There is a very, very, very good indicator right there that you are somebody who does not have a lot of gratitude in your life. Why? Because you have become stiff. You are more concerned about what you disagree with than what unites you. Are you hearing me? You're more concerned about what you disagree with than what you can actually unite around. Why? Because you're not thinking of what you're grateful for. You're thinking about what you don't like. You hearing me? I'm talking to me right now, guys, because I used to be that person every single time someone would speak, the first thing that we would do when we get, get in the car. Yeah, it was a good message, but when the pastor got into this, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> that guy needs to learn to read his Bible. No, just me? Okay, fine. Fine, I, I'll, I'll just own it myself. I'm saying that that's for real. That's for real. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to disagree. That, please, don't, please understand, I'm not saying it's wrong to ask questions. It's not wrong to, to disagree. The, the point being, how often do we zone in on what is wrong instead of zoning in on what we can unite on? And, and zone in on, you know what, your tradition, like so there's people in this room, you come from a Catholic tradition, and, and that tradition is way different than what you just saw today. But what can we unite around? Jesus, what can we unite around? He was dead and now he's alive. I was lost and now I'm found. I was dead and he made me live. We can unite around that, right? When he's returning, do you know, that might not be something we unite around. That might be post-trib, pre-trib, whatever. We could get in all the eschatology of it. He's coming back tomorrow or is he coming back in a hundred years? You know, that's, it's like, these are gray areas, but Oftentimes, we get so rigid, it's a very, very good indicator. You do not have a lot of thankfulness for the people in front of you. You don't have a lot of mercy for the people around you. I heard it said by one of, uh, one of our professors. He said, we need to be charitable to each other. What does charity mean? Charitable means when we disagree with each other, we lend them our mercies. That's being charitable. It's to say, actually, you didn't ask for it. You don't maybe deserve it. But here's my mercy to say, we can disagree, but I still love you. That's not normal outside these walls. And a lot of times it's not normal in these walls, if we're being really honest. Um, In in a Harvard University health study, uh, two psychologists, Dr. Robert Emons of the University of California, 
um, and Dr. Michael McCullough of the University of Miami, have, they have done much research on the idea of gratitude and thankfulness. In one study, listen to this, they asked all participants to write a few sentences each week focusing on particular topics. One group wrote things that they were grateful for that had occurred during the week. So the, the one group says, okay, this, um, this good thing happened to me. I'm going to write it down as something I'm thankful for. The second group wrote about daily irritations or things that had displeased them. And the third wrote about events that had affected them with no emphasis on them being positive or negative. After 10 weeks of doing this with these three groups, those who wrote about gratitude were more optimistic and felt better about their lives. Surprisingly, they also exercised more often and had fewer visits to physicians than those who focused on the source of aggravation. The question isn't, what is it going to take to make me a thankful person? The question is, what will it cost you if you don't become a thankful person? Go to 1 Thessalonians 5.16 with me. What will it cost you if you don't become a thankful, a thankful person? It's what I had said about the door. We become doors that become stiff, rigid, unflexible, unwilling to be moved. If you find yourself in church thinking through, cr being critical about people around you, oh, yeah, you know, they, if they only knew what this person did, and I mean, my goodness, I don't know why they're doing that. They didn't say hi to me. They've never talked to me before. What is that? That is criticalness. It's stealing from you. It's not stealing from them. It's stealing from you. But thankfulness looks at you and the person around us. We could totally go into the four degrees of love here, but we're not going to. But if you look at the people around you, I'm so thankful for them. I'm thankful for them. Whether they've done anything for me or not, I'm so thankful for them. What does it do? It starts to remove that critical seed that is planted within many of us where we give a lot of our attention to the things that are wrong in life rather than the things that are right. How many of you, you go through your whole week and your week was, um, was, was just good? Not necessarily like you, you, know, you had the best week of your entire life, but like really, really good, right? And then as... As you get going, like you, you're walking through your, your week and then one bad thing happens and it just train wrecked. I'm not talking traumatic, okay? So like, let's, a bad thing, not a terrible life altering thing, but a bad thing happens and it derails your entire week, right? Why? Because our attention gets stuck on the one bad thing that happened. This is where people are really bad at leaving work at work and not bringing work home with them. Yeah, I mean, if you only knew what my manager said to me, you believe they said this? I got chewed out on the phone. Like how many husbands or, or wives you come home to your spouse? Yeah, I got chewed out on the phone by this idiot. <laughs> Let's be real. Nate was telling me about his day yesterday. I was like, your world is so different than mine. He's doing CPR in a shower with a patient that's dying. And like, and I'm over here like, yeah, I got yelled at on the telephone. <laughs> like, so different. But I come home and, I'm, and I go to Lydia. I'm like, yeah, this person, this CEO yelled at me on the phone about my doctor. And I'm like, my goodness. And it's like, it's one moment of my whole week. One moment. And that one little ripple has the ability to earthquake the rest of the good. Why? Because I put all my attention on that. Okay? So let's see what Paul says. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, he says, rejoice occasionally. No, yeah, oh, sorry. I usually do it occasionally. Rejoice when you feel like it. Rejoice when everything is good. No, rejoice always, pray occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, pray without ceasing, so like all the time. So like when you're driving in the car and your spouse is complaining about another person, is that when you pray? Like is that when it's like, okay, we're done, we're done talking about this now, we're praying about this now. 
Like I'm telling you, one of the best things, spouses in this room, one of the best things you can do is when you are complaining about, or you hear complaining about somebody, to grab their hand and say, let's pray. Well, that feels weird. It should feel weirder that you have poison coming out of your mouth. Yeah? Pray without ceasing. Give what? Thanks in some circumstances. Okay, I'm done doing it. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is, what is it? It's the will of God in Christ Jesus. For who? For you. It is the will inside of Christ for you. That Jesus is literally the signifying thing for you that we would give thanks in every single situation. A Christian should lead the way. Christians in our culture, in America, in Michigan, in Port Huron, Christians should lead the way as an endlessly thankful people group, limitless in their blissful and hope-filled language of gratitude on the planet not only in our ideal circumstances, but as Paul says, in all of them. That we would become the people whose speech and language is so full of thanksgiving, so full of gratitude, so full of, oh my gosh, the blessings that I have received in Jesus, not even in the earth, but in Jesus, are enough for me to overflow constantly with thanksgiving. How are you, brother? I'm tired. You get, I used to be that person, my mom and dad. How are you, buddy? I'm tired. Sometimes I still am that. How are you doing? It's been, it's been a rough week. The enemy's coming at me. The enemy's coming at me. I, man, the enemy's just been on me. What if it's not the enemy? What if it's you? Can we get, like, the enemy gets way too much credit for stuff that's just us. The enemy's been combating me, man. I can't believe the, I can't believe that that my Amazon package didn't show up on time. <laughs> the enemy, man, he's been attacking me. I didn't get my bio, my the book that I bought online. I'm supposed to be reading it, encountering the Lord. It didn't get here in time, dude. I've heard I've heard some weird answers. Um, the enemy's attacking me, and I'm like, bro, you're yelling at your wife. He's not attacking you. You're attacking you. What are you talking about? Come on. Like so often we're like, oh man, you got to pray for me, brother. It's like, no, like thank the Lord. Get your eyes off the problem. Get your eyes set on God and the rest will figure it out. Okay. The enemy gets the, enemy gets the most done when our eyes are on him. Let's be honest. He gets more done when we're more concerned about, well, what's the enemy up to? I mean, he's, you know, we're, we're getting into our, our news outlets and we're getting into this and we're, uh... dude, can I, for a minute, just for a minute, can I derail for just a second? Do you know that when, when the telegraph got invented, it was the first time where across a country, if you experience bad news, like let's say there was a war in Russia and Ukraine, but, the, but there was no telephones or anything like that. You wouldn't hear about the war for like three to four months because somebody on a, on a little postal carriage would have to make their way all the way across from New York to Oregon to get you and say, hey, actually, guess what? There's a war going on over there. It's been going on for months. You're like, oh, snap. Didn't know that happened. Then they came out with the telegraph, and now it's boop, 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 and instant news. Do you understand, like, what does the news, what does the news do? Like, as a culture, we are eating and feeding on bad news more than any culture that has ever existed upon planet Earth. See, even Levi, is, he's upset about it. He doesn't like it. <laughs> you hear me? <laughs> Leva's like, no, we got to stop. But like, understand that, that before as a person, you could walk through your life. And the only thing that bad happened was like my friend Jebediah's barn burnt down. And we're going to go help Jebediah build it back up. That was what you did. But that was like the worst of it. It's like, oh, this person's dad died. But you didn't, it wasn't like, oh, Trump's at it again. Oh, Biden's at it again. Oh, Kamala's doing that. That wasn't happening. It was just like, you're doing you, and you're doing life with God and with the people. 
But now it's like we consume it. Your phones are, are bringing it to you on a regular basis. Things are bad. Things are broken. Things are evil. People have agendas, agenda, agenda, agenda. And we take it on and then we get surprised. Why do I have zero peace anymore? I don't understand. Why does my whole heart feel so uneasy about everything? Why do I have so much anxiety? Because all we're doing is consuming evil. Come on. I know we've been getting into election year a lot this year, but like we have to understand Christians are supposed to be the most hope-filled people on the earth. The person in the room with the most authority is the person with the most hope. Do you understand that? If you have more hope than I do, you have more authority in this room, in the spirit than I do. The person with the most hope the most confidence and assurance in who Jesus is has the most hope in the room. I'm an I'm authority. So thankfulness is mighty important. It is mighty important for our lives. Here, look at this. In verse 18, it says, give thanks in all circumstances. That word thanks, this is one of my favorite uh, things to talk about. That word thanks, we got into the Greek last week. We're about to get into again. That word thanks is the word Eucharisto. It is where we get the word Eucharist. Anybody know what Eucharist means? It's communion. That's what, So like if you come from like an Anglican tradition or, or a Catholic tra- tradition, you'd say we're going to do, we're going to partake in the Eucharist today. And that is the bread and bo- it's the body and blood of Jesus. It's the communion, Right. It's the Eucharist. What, why do they call it Eucharist? It's because you can't take or partake of this meal unless you have thankfulness. Come on. What did we talk about last week? We talked about the word agape. It actually means love feast. The best translation for it is fellowship meal or a love feast. So that when God says, I love you, he says, I want to share a meal with you. And then what happens? He says, come to my table. Would you abide here? Or that word abide also meant lodge, to live in. Would you abide in my love, live in this fellowship feast? And then guess what we get to do? He says, Eucharist. Now we come to the table and we go, ah, thank you. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. You're like, I don't have anything to be thankful for. You 100% do, and you will for the rest of your life. You have something to be thankful for. Come on. And Paul, he gets, he gets into this. Uh, he continues on it. It says, oh, you know what? I'm going to uh, give you a couple quotes here. A.W. Tozer, he calls this about communion, about the Eucharist. A.W. Tozer called this prayer without ceasing. He, he called this idea of, of living in communion, of thanksgiving. He called it, this is, what, this is what praying without ceasing looks like. It's giving thanks. It's entering into his gates with thanksgiving. That's what praying without, without uh, ceasing means. But he called it habitual conscious communion. And he continues and says, at the heart of the Christian message is God himself waiting for his redeemed children to push into conscious awareness of his presence. And Dallas Willard, he called it the with God life. The with God life. That when we walk in thanksgiving for the Eucharist, for the communion, the blood and body of Jesus, for what he has done for us, we step into the with God life. That, well, what did you see what's on the news? Yeah, I saw what's on the news. But I'm with God. My hope is not in a donkey. It's not in an elephant. It's in the lamb. Come on. Come on. It's not in either of these things. It's in the lamb. That's where my confidence and my assurance and where my hope lies. It's here. So how do we get to this with God life? We need to identify the hinges in which allow this door into the with God life to swing open. Uh, Paul, uh, in, in, in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, I believe that this was Paul writing, but here's the deal. I'm going through seminary right now. I might get to the end and go, you know what? We still don't know. I'm convinced it's Paul, okay? People are like, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. I think it's Paul. Sounds a lot like Paul. I'm the only one who thinks that. Here we go. (laughs) 
Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We enter in through the door by the blood and body of Jesus, our great high priest. But how do we pull that door open? Thank you. How do you participate with the with God life? Thank you. Thank you in every single situation. Colossians 3.16, it says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This verse right here, this is what church looks like. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, which we did for like an hour, and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. What does this tell me? Church is done least well when we do not come in those doors with thankfulness in our hearts. Okay? The outcome of thanksgiving is an invasion of God's glory, presence, and provision, which confronts every area of destruction, lack, and bondage in our lives. The Christian life is done worst when thanksgiving is not on our lips. Yeah? It's when you know you're not doing it right, if there is a right, right? But like, you know you're doing it wrong when you're following Jesus like a grumpy pants as I would call it with my children, when you're just walking around. Like one, one thing I love about kids is when they're sad and upset, like Nate and Kate will totally laugh on this. Like when, when our kids, any of our kids get just bummed out immediately. Oh, <laughs> like their whole posture of their whole being just straw. Man, no ice cream today. Are you kidding me? Right? Right, Bear? Yeah, <laughs> there, there's a reality where like as children, you can just see it. And I'm telling you as Christians, like we have to be the people that are in our schools, in our hospitals, in our businesses, in every area of culture where we are not walking around like, oh man, I can't believe I didn't get that promotion. Oh man, I can't believe the managers, they didn't see me, they didn't notice me. Instead, being like, thank you, Lord. I have food on my table. Thank you, Lord. I have clothes. Thank you, Lord. I have a front door. Otherwise, Ethan will make sure I get one. <laughs> right? I'm getting better at my jokes, you guys. You see it? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. <laughs> bring it down, bring it down. Uh, there's, we're, 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 we are opening our descent right here. Okay? I'm not saying we're landing. We're, we're on our descent, okay? Here we go. There's three examples in the Bible I want to hit on of where thanksgiving opens up the door for provision from heaven, okay? Watch this, okay? Number one, you see it with life, with resurrection power, with Lazarus. In John eleven forty one. 41, check this out. So Lazarus dies. We see Jesus at one point, shortest verse in the Bible. He weeps because Lazarus dies. He, he is acquainted with grief. He's a man of many sorrows. I love that about Jesus. And he goes to Lazarus in verse 41. It says, so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said what? Terrible situations in front of him. People all around Jesus are mourning. If you haven't seen The Chosen, it's a really good picture of how much grief there was in this moment. People are crying and sobbing, and they can't believe this man has died. And Jesus has the audacity to walk into that situation and go, Father, thank you. What? Not, Father, why did this happen? Why? He was my best friend. Why did this happen? He doesn't, he doesn't do that. He steps into the situation. He goes, Father, thank you. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. What does that tell me? That tells me that when we are in our biggest grief, when we are in our biggest suffering, 
that he says, thank you, Lord, that even though I was in grief, you heard me. What happens through that thank you? If you know the story, Lazarus comes out of the grave. But where did it start for Jesus? It started with, thank you, Lord, you heard me when I was in my grief and in my sorrow. One of our professors, um, he says, uh, is, it's Professor Todd Miles, he says this, this wrecked me. He said, lament, which is grief, it's intense sorrow. Lament is grief intermingled with God's hope. It's, it's our grief intermingled with God's hope. What does that mean for us? That, that means as Christians, we can go through really hard situations and, and not be afraid that God, even though I have doubts, even though I have uh, fear and confusion and grief and sorrow and lament, I can actually in, intertangle it and, and interweave it into you, into your hope. And then what's going to spring forth from that? Thank you. You heard me when I was in my most painful situation. And then life comes. Thank you that though there was death, there will be life. I will not allow my grief not to be in intermingled with you. I will not remove my grief, remove my sorrow from the hope that is in Jesus. Ha! Huh. It's beautiful. So we see life when people, when, when Jesus has thanksgiving, when he walks up to the Lord with thanks, we see life. In, in verse, uh, in, the next one would be multiplication. What happens when, when Jesus gives thanks? We get multiplication. Mark 8, 6, it says this. Then he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. This is the story where there's thousands of people. Everyone's hungry. And he took seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples and set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. So they have much lack, okay? Not like, oh, like Jesus isn't stepping into this going, okay, guys, bring me your food. I'm about to multiply it. He's like, just bring me what you have. Come on, that'll preach. That's a whole different message. Just bring me what you've got. Pray what you've got. Give me your heart where it is. God has, Dallas Wood says this, God has yet to meet a single person except for exactly where they are. He has yet to meet you except for right where you are right now. Isn't that amazing? So he says, just bring me what you have. And then in Jesus stepping up to the Father saying, thank you. Why does Jesus even need to say thank you? Like, do you really, if you really think about this, if he already knows the outcome, why is he saying thank you? He's saying thank you because he, he later says in the word, he says, I can't do anything except for what I see my father doing. So when he says thank you, he says thank you that you're multiplying it even before it happens. Where are his eyes? His eyes are not on the problem, they're on the solution. His eyes are not in the lack, they're in Oh, you have, you've already done it. You can do this. So I'll do it because I saw you do it. So when, as a Christian, when we open up our Bible and we see people going through lack, we go, oh, I'm the solution for this. Come on. No, guys, come on. That means like when you see homeless people, like, oh, I, I can't believe that our city's getting covered. It's just homeless people everywhere. You ever hear people complain about that? That drives me nuts. I can't believe there's homeless people everywhere. There's people over here. There's a homeless camp over here. Last, when I read this, my, we were supposed to be the ones to fix it. Oh, we got real quiet on that one. <laughs> Not, amen, brother, let's go. Let's go do it right now. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's to look at the Father and go, oh, you're the solution for it. So, if Christ is in me, he's asked me to do what Jesus does. Yeah, that could look like full-on multiplicating food, but it also could just look like, oh, I have more than enough. I should give. Do you know that the, the ancient church, the church that, that in Rome, that they would fast 
spiritually and for the needs of others. So they would fast to seek the Lord, but they would fast two days a week so that on those days that they would fast, they would say, I was going to spend $10.99 on this nice porterhouse steak, but instead of eating it, I'm going to buy it and bring it to somebody who is hungry. And in my hunger, I associate myself with their pain. Bro, talk about justice. Talk about like, there is no class. Like this, this whole idea of like, I remove from myself the me, 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 and I associate myself with the needs of others. So that way, the next day, when I fill my belly with food, I can go, thank you. There's others out there who are hungry right now. That's what the ancient church did. And they literally eradicated hunger in their midst because they were they associated themselves with lack so that they could provide. That was a good budget bunny trail, okay? <clears throat> Multiplication. Last one. Now we're landing the plane. What did thankfulness do? It also produces deliverance. So we see in Jonah, Jonah 1, 17 through 2, 10, it says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Listen to this, list, this in verse 2. This is a psalm. Do you understand? Like, he's not just saying stuff. Like, he's in a belly of a whale writing psalms down. Like, writing songs of worship in a belly. He says, I call out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds are wrapped around about my head. And at the roots of the mountains... I went down to the land whose bars close upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, oh my God. But I thought God put him in the pit. I thought God was the one who put him in that situation. No, he goes, I got me in this situation. But guess who's going to get me out of this situation? Come on. He's like, I know why I'm here. Some of you guys are like, I don't understand why things are so hard right now. You're, it's hard because you're going against the will of the Lord. Like he resists the proud. Like I, I see so many Christians, they go through hard things. They're like, I don't understand why things are so hard. It's because you're living like hell. You're living like you're walking in resistance to the way God has for you. And you know it. And the whole time you're saying, God, get me out of this. This is like me. I send my kids out to pick up sticks when they're in trouble. I'm like, you're in trouble. Go pick up sticks. It's like them being out there just like, oh, I can't believe I'm picking up sticks. And the louder they freak out about it, the more I'm like, you're going to be out there longer now. <laughs> but as soon as they turn, it's what my grandpa used to say. He rewards the slightest try. As soon as they turn and they go, okay. I do need, I do need not, to not smack my brother. I do need to not scream. I do need to, as soon as there's that turn, that repentance, you're rewarded. Come out. And so here, watch what happens with Jonah. When my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And immediately the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. What got him out? Thank you. Thank you for discipline. Thank you for, for correction. Thank you for adjusting my heart when it's off. Thank you that you discipline those you love. Thank you. <sighs> Some of you are like, oh, that was gross. That's what happened. It wouldn't have been a pretty sight. And in that thankfulness, immediate, immediately Jonah is delivered. Come on. It was, it was the thankfulness that set him free. 
Heaven doesn't see the miracle or resurrection or the miracle of uh, multiply food. The true miracle in heaven's eyes is that someone was thankful while in the midst of great lack. That thankfulness is the best weapon when we are in life and life abundantly or when we are in the valley of the shadow of death. Thankfulness is the best best weapon when we are in great abundance or in the desperation of crushing lack. Thankfulness is the best in glorious public promotion or in the unseen, unheard season of what no one knows who I am. It is the best in the unhurried life of solitude or the hurried and overworked parent who's just trying to get by. Some of you in here, you know what that feels like. You're overworked, overhurried, and and, and it might feel like there's no end to that. Like it's just forever. Thankfulness is the lifeblood to pull on, to say, Lord, you gave yourself for me. And so right now I thank you for what I have. I don't have a lot, but I have you. Thankfulness is always the right direction, no matter your spiritual condition. It is always the right step. You're like, I don't know where to go. Walk in thankfulness. I don't know how to get out of the rut I'm in. Walk in thankfulness. I don't know how to, I don't feel connected to God. Walk in thankfulness. Everywhere Jesus went, he said, thank you. Even in the midst of great tragedy, lament, and pain, the difference of a believer and a non-believer is that the believer can be thankful that they still have a hope to cling to. So how do we clear the way for this in our lives? This is the practical, habitual, how do we habituate this into our lives? How do we get this in us and out of us? Because here's the deal, guys. If you're coming to church just to get knowledge up here and do nothing with it, it's worthless. It's worthless. This has to work into your mind, down into your heart, and it has to manifest in your body. You understand that? I'm, I'm like so tired of seeing Christians just take in information and do nothing with it. It has to get in you, and then it has to do something to your body. What are you? You are a body, a soul, and a spirit. And too often, Christians have been doing nothing but investing into their soul and their spirit and doing nothing with their bodies. Come on, it's time to get our bodies in line with what we say we believe. And so this is what I would ask that we would do. Listen to the words that come out of your mouth. Are you quick to talk about what went wrong or what went right? I am usually that person, I'm going to be so honest with you, where in my day, if Nate texts me and says, hey, what's, how's your day? I, I feel my instant reaction is to first just say what went wrong. And I have to correct myself to say, no, I would rather talk about what went right today. And I don't want fake, I don't want people being fake. Because I, I, there's a balance to this because there's also that reality of like, I'm good, brother. I'm highly favored. Let's go. I'm the, I'm looking on the countenance of Jesus. Woo! Right? And it's like, and it's not always real. That's amazing if it's real, right? Like, do not do not suppress joy in Thanksgiving, okay? But like, if that's not real, don't pretend. But move and walk in thankfulness until it is real. Until it is like for real for you. This is something I think is so important for us to understand. The planes that land safely don't get the news attention. Planes that land safely, they don't get any attention. Why? Because nothing bad happened. But every time a plane lands, it's really a miracle. Like when, it, when, when you're in a plane and you're up in the sky and you come down, this massive, massive thing is somehow going through the sky and then is able to land without killing everyone on board. That's a miracle. But what ha- we, we all are like our own news outlets where unless something crashed, we have nothing to say. Nothing's burning to the ground. I got nothing to talk about. But why don't we talk about the planes that are landing in our lives? That there are little miracles everywhere, all around us, that we're just not, we're not looking at, we're not taking the time of day to go, wow, 
I have four little miracles in my home. Right? Or you have miracles all around you here in this church. Right, here's, what, here's a challenge that we're going to do this month. Write down every single day, every morning, write down five things. Last time I talked about thankfulness, I said 10 things. I think it was too hard for everybody. Write down five things every day for the month of September and watch what happens to your heart. Five things every day. What am I thankful for? And just write it down in a journal, in your phone, and just write it down at the beginning of your day. Watch what happens to your day. Watch what happens to your view of your spouse or the view that you have with your kids or the view of your job. Where you're in your job, you're like, I don't want to go to work today. But then when you thank the Lord, oh my gosh, I have a paycheck. This is great. Some of you guys are like, I hate my job. But then you get, you get fired and you're like, oh no, ah. It's like, oh, it seems like you really loved that job. Come on. I hate my job. I hate going to work. If you got let go tomorrow, you had a plan in place, and now all of a sudden you're grasping for your job back. What does that say? You're pretty mighty thankful for your job, even when you don't like it. I talked to somebody there. And last, not least, this is just practical. This is, I think, the best way to form community. I think this is the way that we live and have our being it's enter with thanksgiving, with God, with family, with church, with our friends, and with our jobs. This whole sermon started with a door. Every doorway you enter into, be thankful. Like this, that doorway, you come into church. Thank you, Lord, I get to gather with believers who love you. I'm not persecuted. Nobody's ready to kill me because I love you. I get to love you with people who love you. Thank you, Jesus. That's why you guys hear me pray all the time. I pray a lot in front of you. I say thank you a lot. Why? Because it's the easiest prayer. So when I go through that door, if I go through Nate and Kate's door, I walk through their door. Thank you for Nate and Kate. I go through my parents' door. Thank you for my parents. I go through my kids' bedroom's door. Thank you for my children. Every door is just the reminder. I walk in the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving. And you're going to walk through a lot of doors even today. Every door you walk through, just remind yourself, thank you. I almost, I'm telling you, there's a smidge of me that wants to do this. I almost want to get into the Orthodox tradition that Jews have, where they put these uh, little things on, the, on each doorway and they touch it as a reminder that I'm the Lord's. I belong to the Lord. And I like, there's that part of me where I'm like, we should be thankful. Every doorway we should go through, we should be like, thank you, God. Right? We're not going to get into that. We're not doing that. I want, I kind of want to though, if I'm being real. But would you join me in doing that? Where every Sunday when you come in here, walk through the door and go, man, what can I be thankful for? Because we should be the most thankful, blissful, endlessly joyful people to be around. We should also be the people that when we experience great grief and sorrow, we still have a thank you on our lips. And I know that's easier said than done. I'm not like, I'm not telling you to fake it. Like, I know that's hard, but like there's, there's an invitation for us that we would be a people that would walk in thanksgiving and I don't want to be the type of church where Thanksgiving rolls around and that's when we talk about it. Because typically it's like, oh, it's Thanksgiving time, time to talk about being grateful. It's like, no, we should be grateful all the time. Yeah? Stand with me. Let's pray. Psalms 100, I'm going to just read this over us and then I'm going to pray. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with what? With gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever in his faithfulness to all generations. So Lord, this morning, we just as a people, 
We say thank you that your faithfulness and your love, it endures forever. We thank you for everything you've given us, the season that we are living in, that you chose us for such a time as this. Lord, help us to walk through every single doorway with thankfulness in our hearts and thankfulness upon our lips. Let us be a people that walk the way you would walk. Lord, that we, we don't want to be a people that aren't acquainted with grief and sorrows, but that we could be acquainted with grief and sorrows, but mingle it with hope and mingle it with thanksgiving. That we would be different, that we wouldn't be steeped in the things of the world, but we would be steeped in thankfulness no matter what is coming at us. So we thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you guys. Mm-hmm.